The images are chilling. Thousands of refugees slipping across the border this winter in darkness and bitter cold. Fleeing the U.S. where they fear they're not safe, hoping they'll be welcomed in Canada if they can make it alive. For some, the dangerous journey with little children is too risky. Erica is one of them. She's desperate to come to Canada, but how? No, de que ya no podíamos regresar a la casa porque si no nos iban a matar. What she finally decides to do will be a gamble of a lifetime. It's a big decision and it's obviously risky. Midweek, downtown Toronto. The surge of asylum seekers can be measured here at this refugee law office. Eight lawyers, 600 cases a year, the poorest of the poor refugees. Every day, more and more people call asking, what should they do now that they're here? The lawyers here agreed to let us follow them for 72 hours to see how the refugee system actually works. His, uh, his life could be at risk, so we need to get those access to... We will meet three of their clients looking for asylum. Um, so you had mentioned there was a problem with one of them. Do you, want to, do you want to tell me what it was? I think one of the biggest misconceptions people have is that uh, it is an easy process, that it's easy uh, to establish that you're a refugee, that, it, uh, that people come here because it makes for an easy life. Across the border in Buffalo, New York, a mother with two children is living in a shelter. Erica shares her story with us on the condition that we protect her identity in case she's sent back to El Salvador. She fears they will be killed by gang members. In one occasion, llegaron a mi casa y me pusieron una pistola en la cabeza, me pidieron cierta cantidad de dinero que les tenía que entregar al siguiente día a la misma hora y yo no tenía ese dinero. And so she fled. 47 days over land through Guatemala, Mexico, Texas, and on to Buffalo. But all along, her ultimate destination and dream is Canada. He escuchado de mucha gente que que Canadá es un país mucho más humano donde están más dispuestos a ayudar a la gente que tiene problemas en su país. Erica has family in Toronto, and that's where she intends to make her claim for asylum. Feeling trapped and desperate, Erica makes a call to Toronto for help. Her plea reaches Andrew Brower, a senior lawyer at the Refugee Law Office. Um, she talks to him from a secret that, location in Buffalo. Pero yo dije, ya estando allá, pues, se buscan los medios. O sea, en mi... Yo nunca, nunca, nunca quise entrar a Canadá de forma ilegal. She's in the United States. Mm -hmm. Legally, right now, what does that mean? Um, for her case, can she just walk over and seek asylum in Canada? The reality is, were she to now go up to the border, she would certainly be turned back uh, and, and pushed back into the U.S. and denied access to our refugee determination process. Brower and the University of Toronto Legal Clinic's Persana Ball Syndrome have her wishes. Please find a way, some way, to get to Canada legally. They reason that if the law says she can't come, maybe the lawyers can work to change the law. We're allowed in on a meeting as they discuss their plan to persuade the Canadian government to pull out of the agreement. I think that the evidence is suggesting that the U.S. is not doing its part, so Canada is breaching its obligations by relying on a partner that's not fulfilling its obligations in the process. So we need to overturn the agreement. Hanifi Uzdemir is Kurdish and fled Turkey fearing persecution. When he left, 
His youngest was just a month old. Now, being with them is just a memory. He's waited five years for a hearing. Ve eşim diyor ki sen beni niçin getirdin yani ben sen benimle yaşamıyorsun ki. Neden amcanın ötesi? Götüreceğim bakayım ne zaman kavunuz olsun. This is Hanifi's problem. In 2012, the government passed a law that promised faster hearing dates for the new wave of refugees. But to meet that goal meant pushing back the existing claims. So for Hanifi and thousands like him, well, they're now part of a huge backlog. Hanifi worries that the new influx of refugees will mean a longer wait for him. You know, there has been some um, question if um, Canada should open its border to other refugees in the U.S. If more, more refugees are let in, does a part of you get scared? Oh my God, what is that going to mean for my case? O alsın da zaten bizimki gecikir. İnsanları tabii ki alsın. İnsanlar zor durumdadır. İyi yapıyor olmasına da. Diyorum ya yeni gelmiş. Benim gibi burada beş sene beklemiyor. O insanları bir sene durdurup bizim gibilerini geç, çıkartabilirler aradan. The waiting five years may seem bad. For others, it's worse. Their cases have been rejected. Those are the ones Bruce worries about the most where deportation is imminent. One client in particular is on her mind. There are people who get deported to, the, to their death because mistakes have been made. Kasai Gabari is from Eritrea, one of the most repressive regimes in Africa. There are only four religions permitted in the country and Pentecostal Christianity isn't one of them. So, he fled to Canada. Here, the refugee board denied his claim in many appeals that followed. They didn't believe he was Eritrean, and he didn't have enough documents to prove it. After losing his case, Kasai went into hiding. I understand that there was a period where you had gone underground. Um, what prompted you to do that? I was very afraid to go even uh, uh, to, to them to send me back. I was thinking that they'd pick me and throw me in Eritrea. Eventually, he was arrested and put in detention. That's when he met Catherine Bruce. She's filed a petition pleading his case. And today is the day he'll be told if he can stay. She prepares him for the worst. So, Kasai, I'm hopeful that you will succeed. Um, but I have to warn you, however, that the acceptance rate of these applications is only around 3%. There is a risk, again, of further detention. Um, if that happens, uh, you can be sure that we will be there to fight for you. How do you make the determination that someone doesn't just have a fantastical story about persecution, but they're not actually in any danger, versus someone who is truly a refugee? There are facts that you can check and cross-check. In the end, the decision maker will have to determine whether the account has the ring of truth about it. You know the critics um, listening to this would say, wait a minute, are you saying that someone who has lied in some way in their application should still be allowed to stay in Canada? You don't kill people because they lie. Simplified. Desperate people sometimes have to resort to desperate measures. For example, Jewish families here today in Canada who had they not, had their family members not lied, had not found a way out during the Holocaust, they would not be here. So I think we need to be very, very careful 
about saying that just because somebody lied, they're not deserving of Canada's protection. As they drive to the hearing, this might be Kasai's final day of freedom in Canada. Nine three in the gate. Nine three. You're looking a bit pale now. Yeah, you're looking a bit nervous. Okay. So, yeah. So as uh, I think you know, Kasai, we have to go and check in here. Yeah. And then they'll take us to uh, another uh, room where we will be given the decision. Okay. When the decision is made, we will hopefully, we will both come down and hopefully we'll see a happy uh, Kasai. Um, the worst case scenario would be that you don't see Kasai because he's been detained. When we come back, we learn Kasai's fate. You count on the Fifth Estate for investigative journalism that matters. The Fifth Estate team often counts on you, the viewers, for tips that lead to some of the best investigations. We felt uncomfortable. Very disturbing. To send your tips, email fifthtips at cbc.ca or go to the show website to find out other ways to get in touch. protection of the nation from foreign terrorist entry into the United States. We all know what that means. The fallout of President Trump's immigration policies has been chaos and fear. Many refugees anxious about their chances in the U.S. are looking up north in Canada for a solution. But why cross by walking in the freezing cold? This is why. In 2002, Canada signed a deal with America. The deal says, wherever a refugee lands first, Canada or the US, that's where they'll have to make their claim. The supporters of the agreement say it is meant to prevent asylum shopping by refugees. But here's the problem. The way it was written, it only applies to official border crossings. So in a strange twist, those who sneak into Canada can stay. And those who try to come in legally are turned away. Canadian immigration minister says he has no plan to suspend the agreement. Refugee lawyer Andrew Brower strongly disagrees. Closing your borders means closing your eyes uh, and being complicit in people going back to places where they're being persecuted and tortured. There are somewhere in the range of 11 million undocumented people living in the U.S. right now. Is there a possibility that these 11 million people could come knocking at our door and uh, make a claim. Realistically, okay. we're not going to get 11 million undocumented people from the U.S. Well, wanting people are to, worried about to, that, to, right? Of course, of course they are. Um, but practically speaking, the vast majority of people, as I understand it, who are in the U.S. living without documents, they're not refugees. They don't fit those very narrow parameters of the Refugee Convention. Brower thinks the United States isn't safe for refugees. He wants to use Erica, the woman from El Salvador, as a test case. He shares the plan with Erica, who is currently in Buffalo, hiding. He wants her to try to enter legally, and once she's rejected, he'll put his plan into action. And we could ask a judge of the court to stop Canada from pushing you back into the U.S. But there's a risk that the plan can also backfire and you could be returned to the U.S. right away. And of course, being pushed back to the U.S. after having been denied formally by Canada puts you and your daughters at risk of being jailed. Uh, so we the team leaves it to Erica. So it's a, it's a big decision, and I don't want you to even consider making that decision right now, but it's, it's obviously risky. I wonder if you guys can ask Erica what part of it is the most scary for her. Pues el temor más grande es 
que, que me regresen a mi país porque porque temo por la vida de mis hijas y por la mía. Erica's next move could change Canadian law, but either way, it will change her life forever. Being at the office, it's clear that the refugee system doesn't just take a toll on the clients. When people have told you things that they have never told anybody in their life before, when they really are in danger and they're not heard, and their plea for compassion is not heard, that keeps me awake at night. What would you say is the hardest part of your job? Losing. I mean, honestly, the stakes are enormous. Uh, and so the wins are fantastic. And you, you, know, you realize that you've, had, you've played a small part in people getting to safety or bringing families together. That's, that's wonderful. But losing cases, um, as, as great as winning is, losing is just horrific. And it, that, that can be haunting, for sure. Do you take it personally? A little. Yeah, of course. I mean, if you invest, uh, then you're invested in, in the wins and the losses. Yeah, no, for sure. And you, um, you need to find ways to, to cope with that. But we should stop because I'm going <laughs> to... Oh, if there's more you want to talk about... No. I just wanted a second not to cry, that's all. <laughs> well, why, why do you think you're going to cry? Because, uh, like, when people get on a plane and go, that, that really is awful. Back near Toronto's Pearson Airport, we wait outside the immigration office. Eritrean asylum seeker Kasai Gabre is here to learn if he can stay in Canada. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Smile. We have a smile. Uh, yes. How did it go? It goes good, really. What good. happened? Uh, I think they accept my humanitarian and uh, uh, pra. Which is great, he's been approved in principle, which is fantastic, he yeah, has uh, permission very, to stay here now. But very, it's, anyway, overall, yeah. it's fantastic news, right? <laughs> thank you. Thank and you should have seen him face, his you. face in there, he was just like so delighted. Finally! Yeah. After, after, after almost 12 years. years. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it is very fantastic, really. I'm very happy. What are you thinking? Uh, now, yeah. mm, I don't know, nothing. <laughs> you know, I'm happy, really, because uh, I was hanged, nothing to do, you know. Even if I work, I was not working with a full heart. So, uh, many things, you know. Oh, this is very, I'm very happy. What I'm are you going to do today? Today, I won't take you somewhere else. I will invite you. <laughs> Yeah, great. Really? You, you must, yeah. It's the nicest part of doing yeah, this work. Really, Fantastic. I'm very happy. Congratulations Thank you, and welcome Thank you. to finally legal status yeah. in Canada. Yeah. <laughs> this was just 72 hours in one refugee legal clinic. We'll continue to follow their stories in the months to come. <laughs>